The news of Europe as it occurs. The world is now awaiting the arrival in Berlin of Sir Neville Henderson, British ambassador to Germany, who took off from England's Heston Airdrome nearly three hours ago, flying to Berlin with the British cabinet's answer to German Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Now, during this broadcast period, we shall hear the latest word direct from the two key cities of London and Berlin as our CBS representatives speak to us across the ocean by shortwave radio. First in London, waiting to speak to us now, is the chief of Columbia's European staff, Mr. Edward R. Murrow. And to hear Mr. Murrow, we switch you now to London. This is London. Europe is all paradox these days. For instance, one of the few places in Europe where international railway traffic is undisturbed is the Polish corridor. Germany's transit arrangements continue to function without a hit. Trains continue to cross the corridor without a hit. And Germany is said still to be sending military transport over the line. Now here in London today, the Chinese and Japanese ambassadors called at the foreign office. And they called together. And that's something that London hasn't seen for a long while. It's also just been announced that Germans have been instructed to leave Hong Kong. Croydon Airport will be blacked out tonight, and the Admiralty have forbidden the use of wireless transmitting apparatus from any seagoing ship in British territorial waters. And I should not be surprised to see certain steps taken during the next 24 hours to establish what would be called a voluntary censorship over certain other forms of communication. The first defense orders, or decrees, were issued here today. They cover a lot of territory. Power is given to order compulsory evacuation for both people and animals. In other words, if the government says go, you've got to go whether you like it or not. Compulsory billeting is provided for. And that means that if you had a house in the country with an extra room, the government might bill it without your consent to or three people in that room. Private premises may be taken over. Traffic on the roads may be regulated. And the carrying of cameras will be prohibited in certain areas. And there's another provision. It states that no person shall have under his control or liberate any racing or homing pigeon. Prices of foods and other commodities may be controlled. And the dispatch from the United Kingdom of material other than that handled by mail may be controlled or stopped altogether. There are more than a hundred separate items in the list, and there will probably be others to follow. Well, those surprising Russians are still handing out surprises. And Voroshilov, the war minister, says there's no reason why Russia should not supply the Poles with arms and materials, just as the Americans, and incidentally the British, have been supplying them to Japan for the last two years. The feeling is growing here that the agreement with Russia may, in the end of the day, do Germany more harm than good. We shall probably have more information on that point after the speeches in Moscow tonight. As you know, the House of Commons meets tomorrow at 2.45 London time. And I can tell you that the Prime Minister is being urged very strongly, not only to outline the recent exchange between Hitler and the British government, which so far remains a secret, but he has today been urged by certain opposition leaders to tell the whole story of the breakdown of negotiations with the Soviet Union. If he does tell that story, we shall be in for further surprise. Mr. Chamberlain has been told that Parliament will provide a good sounding board, that a full, complete statement would convince doubters that he has no appetite for personal government and is prepared to defend Britain's action in the open. Of course, what he says will, in large measure, depend whether or not, will, be, will depend upon whether or not he has received Herr Hitler's reply to Britain's message, which Sir Neville Henderson is now taking to Berlin by air. On the whole, I should say that the possibility of avoiding war has not increased during the day. Government circles are, in fact, exceedingly pessimistic. But there is a general belief that the strategic position is improved, that Hitler is hesitating, that the Russians may betray the Germans. You are already aware of the reaction in Tokyo and Madrid as a result of Hitler's retreat to Moscow. We are not yet certain of its full effect in Rome. Italy still has only a quarter of her army under arms. And if war comes, and Italy stands with the Germans, she will suffer more terrible havoc than will Germany. There is still hope that Hitler may pause and think again. There is still the possibility of a conference. The people with whom I have talked in London today certainly haven't expressed any optimism. But their spirit is better. They believe the Germans are worried and uncertain 
if not frightened. And that's a pleasant situation for most Englishmen. They think, rightly or wrongly, that they now have the initiative. That if war comes, they will win it. But that if we have a conference instead, the result is likely to be only a postponement. That view is reflected in the evening news, which says, what can Britain or France do to prevent war at the last moment, unless Herr Hitler takes some step toward calling off his dogs and agreeing, in the words of President Roosevelt's appeal, to refrain from any positive act of hostility for a reasonable stipulated period. Even if Herr Hitler did so agree, it would but postpone the day of reckoning so long as he is in his present mood, which is that of a wayward child who has never been caught. So far as I can learn, the Poles have not been subjected to pressure by Britain. No one could truthfully say that the alliance with Poland has ever aroused any popular enthusiasm in Britain. Britishers know very little about Poland. The necessary historic and sentimental ties are missing. But the matter is not now so much one of Poland as it is of Britain's pledged word and the determination to move in one direction or the other out of this twilight of peace. Hitler has made his demand. Now he pauses. It is difficult to see how any solution is to be reached on Hitler's terms. That is to say, any solution that would provide anything more than a temporary relief. Now the Queen is returning from Scotland tonight, and the two princesses are remaining there. Everything is being prepared for zero hour. Britain is moving up to the line, and I should be less than truthful if I fail to report that some people see it coming with almost a sense of relief. Those are the people who maintain that the retreat has gone on far too long, and that courage and determination are now required. And they feel that perhaps war is the only solution, and that the resulting world order will be better than the one we have fumbled with for the past 20 years. I don't know, but the decision must be made. And the folks here seem to think it will be made during the next 36 hours. I return you now to America. That was London and the voice of the chief of Columbia's European staff, Mr. Edward R. Murrow. Now let's hear from the German capital, where high government officials are awaiting the arrival of the returning British ambassador. To hear the chief of Columbia's continental staff, William L. Shirer, we take you now to Berlin. Hello, America. Hello, CBS. This is Berlin. The sands are running fast. Tonight, here in Berlin, we should have a decision whether it's to be peace or war. It's just eight minutes to eight Berlin time, and Sir Neville Henderson, the British ambassador, is due to arrive any minute now from London. A big Mercedes car is waiting for him out at the Tempelhof Airdrome, and will rush him to Herr Hitler's chancellery in the Wilhelmstrasse as soon as he arrives. The outcome of this historic meeting is now in the lap of the gods. Although word has sifted through this afternoon, that the British government cannot accept the demands which Herr Hitler made public last night, namely a return of Danzig and the corridor to Germany, the Wilhelmstrasse, when I left it a few minutes ago, was maintaining silence, preferring to wait until it knew what Ambassador Henderson brought back. The feeling in German government circles on the eve of this crucial meeting is still firm, and the entire press this evening maintains that Germany cannot and will not compromise, that the Reich will not budge an inch from its demands on Poland for the return of Danzig in the corridor. It is not entirely ruled out, of course, that the British answer, which it's believed contains certain counter-proposals, may necessitate a reply. But the tension has become so terrific that it does not seem possible to anyone here that it can long continue, probably not past tonight, without events taking a turn one way or the other. Or as the Germans say, so order so. In the meantime, Germany seemed already on a complete war footing today. Housewives stood in lines beginning early this morning to get their ration cards. It was the first time since the war that these cards had made their appearance. And the people who had hardly believed a couple of days ago that war was possible certainly looked grimmer as they stood patiently waiting for their cards. With true German efficiency, the rationing system swung into operation very smoothly. At any store today, if you wanted certain foodstuffs, foodstuffs or soap or shoes, you had to show your card. Otherwise, you were politely turned down. The newspapers and the radio have assured the population several times today 
that there is food and clothing and soap and shoes and fuel enough for every German, that the rationing was only resorted to in the interests of fairness to all. But everyone taking the new measures with good, by taking these measures with good grace, the people are told, they are helping to defend the freedom of Germany. Most papers praise the German woman for the calmness with which she has taken not only the rationing of foodstuffs and materials, but also the spirit with which she has seen her menfolk, husbands, sons, or fathers, off to the army in the last few days. The military took an ever-increasing part in the picture in Berlin as today advanced. Cars with high army officers sped up and down the Wilhelmstrasse or down the Tiergartenstrasse to the war ministry in the Bendlerstrasse. Many cars and motorcycles were requisitioned. I saw several civilian motorcyclists who had been called up with their vehicles. They received an army armband, and you could see them speeding through the streets carrying messages. Despite the needs of the armed forces, the gasoline situation improved today. I was able to buy two gallons a few minutes ago, which enabled me to get here in time for this broadcast. Men from the air service supervised the tanking up. Squadrons of big bombers have also been roaring low over the city in formation. In other words, though the talking stage has not yet been completely abandoned, the grim preparation for the worst goes on. I understand no trains from Germany crossed any borders today, but those foreigners trying to get out were able to proceed as far as the frontier and then either walk or get some kind of transportation to the other side of the border. Note that Germany has already assured Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Switzerland that it will respect their neutrality in case of war. But tonight we heard that Holland had decided to mobilize. Well, all depends now on the talks which will be beginning here in a few minutes between Herr Hitler and the British ambassador. I hope to be on the air later tonight to tell you what I can about those talks. This is William L. Shire, and returning you now to New York. In this moment of waiting, as all the world is awaiting the arrival of the British ambassador to Germany, Sir Neville Henderson, in Berlin, we've been listening to our correspondents in London and in Berlin speaking to us by shortwave radio across the ocean. And now, here in New York, let's hear a few words from our CBS Foreign News analyst, Mr. Elmer Davis. Here's Mr. Davis. You notice that Mr. Scharer said that in Berlin they're expecting Sir Neville Henderson in a few minutes. Well, the information from London is that he left only at one o'clock. I understand the normal commercial flying time between London and Berlin is five hours and three quarters, and while in a special plane he'll probably make better time, it seems unlikely that he can meet Chancellor Hitler before five or six. Now, the most encouraging thing, certainly, in these broadcasts that we have just heard is Mr. Scharer's remark that it is felt possible in Berlin that the British answer may necessitate a reply, which would at least mean a little more delay and a chance uh, for possibly some satisfactory settlement of the situation. Mr. Morrow, you notice, said that in London the possibility, it is felt that the possibility of avoiding war has not increased, which is a very temperate remark, but that the strategic position is regarded as improved. Now that, of course, refers primarily, I presume, to the situation of political strategy, but it's just possible that it may also refer to military and naval strategy as well. There were reports uh, today of a possible mediation by Mussolini. They were emphasized in Rome, and uh, there was indication that uh, some uh, satisfaction would be felt with such a move in Berlin. A Rome dispatch says that the Italian press, as if by signal, emphasized that all the world was looking to Mussolini to avert war. Well, of course, the Italian press uh, usually does things by signal. Virginio Gaida, who is generally the spokesman for the government, wrote in the Giornale d'Italia that while the world is on the edge of a European catastrophe, even more insistent in general are the appeals being made to Premier Mussolini. A last-minute miracle is talked about. Direct intervention by Premier Mussolini is mentioned as a means for saving peace. Now, it seems to me conceivable that uh, most of those appeals have come from Rome. We know uh, from all evidence that's come to us that the Italians, very far from enthusiastic about all this, uh, they have nothing to gain by a war against Poland with which their own relations have always been friendly, and if they should enter into the war, they are far more exposed than Germany to attack by England and France.